Hello there. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Live from New York, it's Tuesday night. Welcome to the Linnaean Society's December 2021 speaker meeting. My name is Ken Chea. I'm the president of the Linnaean Society of New York, and I would like to now call this meeting to order. Well, we made it to December once again. Uh, congratulations. Um, our winter visitors, the ruddy ducks, the northern shovelers, uh, hooded mergansers have all returned to our local waterways. There are white throated sparrows everywhere, fox sparrows, uh, my, one of my favorites, I love the fox sparrows, and juncos, chickadees, titmice, um, winter finches are arriving daily, and uh, as well as a few really nice unexpected visitors here in New York City. Uh, we are seeing Western tanagers, uh, a gray kingbird, a drake king eider, and a henslow sparrow all continue to be seen in various parks in New York City. I encourage everyone to get outside and enjoy winter birding wherever you may live. And if you are interested, uh, you may want to keep in mind that uh, the annual Audubon Christmas count, Christmas bird count is um, coming up. And um, you may want to check your uh, local Audubon chapter to find out more about that uh, wherever you live. The count for the metropolitan area will be held this coming Sunday, December 19th. Well, according to my participants list, we have 67, 68, 69. Uh, they're arriving. Uh, what people are watching live. So once again, a very warm welcome to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight, we're in for a real treat. We have Christian Hagenlocker live from Seattle, who will be Go Seahawks. <laughs> who will be sharing his big year of birding on a budget with us. Uh, for tonight's program, we have disabled the Zoom chat feature, as well as the video and microphone. The Q&A feature is fully functional, however, and during this evening's program, we encourage you to use that feature down at the bottom of your screen to send us any questions that you may have for tonight's speaker. Following the presentation, our Vice President Gabriel Willow will take some time to select a few questions for Christian. Before we get underway with tonight's program, I have a few business items to cover, uh, <clears throat> including the most recent results of our members voting, how to become a Linnaean Society member, and an announcement from the American Museum of Natural History regarding the use of the Linder Theater. We'll begin with the recent voting of our members. And thank you, by the way, to all of you who, all of you dedicated members who send in your votes promptly. Uh, motion number one, to accept the November 2021 meeting minutes passed unanimously by a vote of 165 to zero. So that's a good start for the evening. More good news on motion two, with 161 votes of approval, zero votes of opposition, and four votes of abstention, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the following 17 applicants as new members of the Linnaean Society of New York. <clears throat> Susan Gibson, sp sponsored by Kevin Sisko. Susan Dahl, sponsored by Miriam Rakowski. Janet Reese, sponsored by Teresa Brown. Jennifer Kalb, sponsored by Amanda Bielskis. Karen Becker, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Hilary O'Toole, sponsored by Ken Chea. Linda Musser, sponsored by Elise Boger. Frank Rotella, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Debbie Becker, sponsored by Ken Chea. Kelly Burney, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Haley Clancy, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Irina Rich Langer, sponsored by Mary Beth Cooper. Hey, Mary Beth, what, what kind of vitamins are you taking this month? I want some. Mary Hillies, sponsored by Miriam Rakowski. 
Matthew de Goulis, sponsored by Amanda Bielskas. Renee Shaw, sponsored by Amanda Bielskas. <clears throat> Nicholas Susnia, sponsored by Anne Lazarus. Amy Susnia, sponsored by Anne Lazarus. If any of you new members are out there listening right now, <clears throat> congratulations to all and a very, very warm welcome to the Linnaean Society of New York. <clears throat> now, if anyone's wondering how do I become a member, it's really simple. Just go to our website, linnaeannewyork.org, and you will find all the information you need right there uh, to apply. In case you need a sponsor and you don't know that many Linnaean members just yet, don't worry about a thing. We are a friendly group and our sponsorship requirement is really more of a formality and less daunting than it would may sound. In fact, if you need a sponsor, I welcome you to, you may contact me. I'll be happy to sponsor you. In addition, you may contact any other officers of the society uh, about sponsorship, the vice president, the treasurer, our secretary, and our editor, all of their email addresses, as well as mine, can be found at the bottom of the homepage. Just click on contacts and write to any of us officers about sponsorship or if you have any questions about sponsorship. And please remember, any society or organization is only as healthy as its growing and diverse membership. We welcome all to become members of the Society of Linnaean Society of New York, regardless of race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, background, ability, or geographic location. We're a friendly group and we would love to hear from you. And if you love birds and nature and care about the environment and wanna meet people who feel the same way, We'd be delighted to welcome you to our inclusive community of birders and naturalists. For item number three, I'd like to now update everyone on the Society's uh, future speaker meetings. This past week, we learned from the American Museum of Natural History that because of the ongoing pandemic, the Linder Theater, where we normally meet in person to host our speaker meetings each month will remain closed to public events at least until the fall of 2022. So until further notice, we will continue to broadcast our meetings and our speaker presentations live using Zoom, just as we're doing tonight. And now for tonight's feature presentation, the topic of tonight's presentation is a quest. Tonight, Christian Hagenlocker will take us on a journey, his journey, while living out of his Subaru Outback and cutting corners to save money to some of the most remote areas of this continent in search of wild birds. From the remote island of Atu, Alaska, to Florida's dry tortugas, Christian will share his encounters with some of the amazing birds, as well as with other birders and people he met along the way. Christian Hagenlocker's passion for birds began at an early age, when he saw a pair of peregrine falcons nesting on a building in downtown Seattle. Since then, he has read every book and field guide he could get his hands on, and his passion for birds and education has only grown. Passionate about the education of people of all ages, he entered the teaching profession after completing a bachelor's degree in biology in 2011. As a high school science teacher and licensed falconer, Christian has integrated birds into his local school curricula in unique ways, exposing students to the ancient sport of falconry and leading international science-based trips to Belize, Costa Rica, Israel, Colombia, and Peru. In 2016, Christian became the youngest person to break the 700 mark in an ABA big year. His book, Falcon Freeway, A Big Year of Birding on a Budget, 
describes his adventures and lessons learned while living on the road and birding in the 21st century. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Christian Hagenlocker. Good evening, everyone. So nice to be with you here tonight. Thank you for that introduction, Ken. And I'd like to start by congratulating all of the new members that were just accepted into the Linnaean Society of New York. It's an exciting group to be a part of, and I'm honored to be joining you tonight and to be sharing with you my 2016 big year on a budget. I'd like to share my screen real quick, so please bear with me as we get all of the technical things out of the way. Can you guys see my slide? All good. Awesome, thank you so much. So I'd like to start by taking you on a journey. And this journey, like most, are not short or for the faint of heart. And so this is really a personal journey for me of sharing 366 days of my life with you. And that's a challenging thing for me to do, to take what happened each day for an entire year and distill it into a book or an hour long talk or a series of lectures that I give to different groups. So I pardon any um, mistakes, omissions, factual mix-ups as I continue to grow older and travel around the world birding. Um, I'm just filling my brain with more knowledge and forgetting things that I didn't even know that I learned. And so this will be a great chance for me to discover some of the exciting things that have happened in 2016 as we revisit this year and explore the continent of North America together. So I'd like to start by just giving you a little bit of an overview. You can see kind of a mosaic of photos of different bird species. And it really was a pleasure and an honor to get a snapshot of the health and biodiversity of our continent, um, specifically the bird life in one calendar year. And people ask me what the most engaging or exciting thing of doing a big year was. And it was seeing an entire country, uh, all 49 states in the lower 48, and then I visited Alaska in one year. So it gave me a wonderful opportunity to meet just the diverse cast of feathered friends that we share our continent with. I'd like to start just by giving a little bit of a, a biography to me. I have grown up loving birds. Both grandmothers were very influential in my development as a birder and as a naturalist. My parents encouraged me to be different and to, be, and to march to the beat of my own drum. And so um, I made friends very easily as I moved around the country as the son of a military pilot. And everywhere I went, everywhere we moved, there were birds. And so I grew up looking for birds from the beaches of South Padre Island as a toddler to the beaches of Port Ludlow, Washington in, uh, in Seattle, where I currently live. My childhood was uh, formed by lots of different stories. So I absorbed any bird knowledge that I could get from reading stories from Roger Torrey Peterson and James Fisher's book, Wild America, to Ken Kaufman's Kingbird Highway, which inspired me to do my own big year. The book, The Big Year by Mark Masick was influential also, and that was eventually turned into a Hollywood movie, which made me even more interested in birding and has spread the concept of doing a big year far and wide on the, on the Hollywood screen. And then believe it or not, I'm one of those kids who read field guides cover to cover. And so I was gifted the Sibley Guide to Birds, I believe in 2001 from my next door neighbor whose bird feeders I filled for her. And she was an older woman, but she loved the birds and her gift of this field guide to me allowed me to thumb through it and look at all of the diverse birds, their range maps. And I was super fascinated by all of the birds that lived in the remote corners of the continent and had very specific ranges or were only found kind of on the fringes of the continent. And I always wondered what it would be like to travel to these areas and not just see the bird, but see what those places were like. And so that was the underlying spark that got me interested in big year birding. So currently um, I'm living my dream, just teaching here in Seattle, Washington. I teach seventh grade science and then have a mechanics of flight elective class that I love teaching and also a digital photography class. I was recently married and so I'm enjoying owning a home and living with my wife. 
and I'm still a licensed falconer. I've been training a hybrid Merlin crossed with a peregrine falcon over the course of the last year that I've raised from a young bird to an adult now. In my free time, I enjoy traveling and bucket listing. So I've moved on from bird listing to now checking off items on my bucket list, such as uh, diving with manta rays at night in Hawaii, which I show you in this picture on the lower left-hand corner. I've also enjoyed traveling internationally and looking at new birds and kind of having new experiences that I've always wanted to have uh, traveling around the world. So the journey has not stopped. In the future, I hope to continue supporting bird organizations and continuing to teach. I've also been doing some raptor research on the side, so following pet projects from observations I've made over the years and continuing to ask scientific questions and answer them with data, in particular looking at how different populations of raptors are evolving or diverging or cohabitating uh, urban habitats with humans. I'm, you'll hear a little bit about the, bird, the birding project tonight, and I'll be sharing a little bit more about my goals for advancing that in the future. I continue to be a student of photography and try to photograph birds and in, improve my craft and as a digital wildlife photographer. And my bucket list trip that I'm still working to materialize is getting to the continent of Antarctica, which is on my bucket list as well. So I'd like to take you a step back as we start our story um, in 2016. And this video was produced by a, an optics company called Maven, who I approached for sponsorship in 2016. And so uh, you'll hear this is kind of a, a promo ad for Maven, but also me telling my story as I try and get the word out and ask for support in 2016. So this was filmed in March. I was just newly minted as a big year birder. I'd only had three months under my belt. And you'll sense kind of the uncertainty and the hope and optimism that I have for this experience moving forward. So without further ado, we will take a look at how the birding project got started. At the beginning of the year, I found myself without a job. That's uh, the short way to say it. And I was on a birding trip and driving my car through the Southern United States. I'd already seen some great birds or life birds as we birders call them, new birds that I'd never seen before. And I decided at that time that this was the point in my life that I could do a big year. A week into my journey, I met some other birders that suggested I interview birders along the way and tell their stories and share the stories of birders. I love that idea because many people do big years and the focus is about them. For me, it's not about the record, but it's about my personal growth and becoming a better birder through that process. So I focused on doing a big year that allows me to meet other people and learn about birders and birding through the lens of others instead of telling a story through just my own experience and my own viewpoints. My name is Christian Hagenlocker and I am the Birding Project. So my schedule each day differs a little bit. I, I'm spending most of the time so far this year alone, which is great, but I have so much time to think and ponder things and plan my trip as I'm driving for seven or eight or nine hours a day to get to the next spot. Recently, I've seen some amazing birds, and I never thought that driving into Wyoming in the winter would yield so many cool new species for the year. Just the other day, I saw the American Dipper along this high mountain stream uh, in the snow. It was beautiful. And seeing this songbird jump from rock to rock and plunge into the water fearlessly and dive underneath uh, was just such a cool experience. I've seen dippers before, but this was just really a special experience for me. Thank <laughs> you. 
Another bird that I saw in Wyoming for the first time, it was a life bird, was the greater sage grouse. And that was just a fantastic experience. I think that currently that's my, my favorite bird because I had such a wonderful opportunity to view sage grouse on a lek, which is their mating ground. So I've spent several mornings before the sun comes up out in the sagebrush sea. It's just been a magical experience to watch the sky get light and watch the grouse wake up with the morning. And that's that really makes me happy to not just see things for myself, but be able to share that experience with others and hope that they can appreciate the magic of those moments the same way that I do. Living out of my car has been definitely an interesting experience. Each morning I wake up and uh, I always cook oatmeal right out of the back of my car uh, sitting on the tailgate and boil water for hot chocolate. I eat ramen every day, it's really cheap and uh, I don't mind the taste. I have a cooler in the back of my car and I keep a half gallon of milk and some fresh fruit and sometimes meat and cheese for sandwiches. It's been really awesome to occasionally be invited out to dinner by other birders or people that I meet in the field, and it's wonderful to sit down and eat a real meal every once in a while. A lot of the areas that I travel to have not always had cellular data for me to access email or submit my eBird observations using my phone, so I regularly stop each night or each morning at local coffee shops or a McDonald's. I try and go to McDonald's because it has really cheap food, so I always try and buy something for a dollar and then sit and work on my computer for a while. That allows me to upload pictures to update my blog at thebirdingproject.com and tell the stories of the amazing people that I meet and interview all across North America. I'm not quite sure how this year will unfold. I do know that I'm driven by my passion for birds and birding and sharing my love for that with other people. And I think that as long as I'm able to continue on this adventure and share my love with other people for, for birds and birding, I will find a way to make this work. I'm able to wake up each day and be grateful for where I'm at in my life and what I'm able to do. I know that that's what drives me. I'm expecting good each and every day and know that that can be a part of my experience. And we'll see what this year holds. It's still early. There's still lots more places to go and birds to see and people to talk to and things for me to learn. All right, so that gives a, a little bit of a snapshot, at least, of where I was in March of 2016 after spending a month living on an island washing dishes, earning money from my birding blitz that I did in the month of January, where I saw about 365 species in one month. So that was about half of my goal. And so I thought I was pretty optimistic. I was thinking that I could definitely do this. So you heard a little bit about the birding project and the logo that the video closed out with was where I was at that time. And the birding project has just grown and evolved since then. And I came up with the acronym to have an epic big year. And so epic is uh, an acronym for engage, preserve, inspire, and connect. So I hope to engage people with birds, promoting learning both for them and as a teacher to promote learning with students. And so as I birded around the country in 2016, I had tried to work with other organizations and schools to teach, and that helped get a paycheck to come in as I was a guest professor or a guest lecturer and spoke with different groups. I dissected owl pellets with a group of students in Colorado and really, really just had a chemistry with that school. And I ended up getting hired by them to teach after my big year, starting off in January of 2017. So that led to my next job. 
I also worked with Hog Island Audubon Camp in Maine and have returned there every summer since as an instructor. So the connections made and engaging people with birds have really lasted uh, in the years since. I made it a goal to preserve bird habitat in urban and rural areas. And while this was a challenge for me individually, I was able to support larger organizations that, had, that made it this mission. And I helped reseed prairies in urban Chicago neighborhoods with a conservation group. I attended and facilitated, um, well, I guess I, I didn't run it, but I helped out with a controlled burn on Little St. Simon's Island while I was working there in coastal Georgia. And then I had many other opportunities to ban birds, to um, participate in citizen science by submitting my observations to eBird, and to work with a variety of other groups throughout the year. I was hoping by leading by example, I would be inspiring people to get outside and explore nature. And I took people outside throughout the year and often guided different groups to earn extra money to help fund my travels by being a, a birding guide. And lastly, my goal of connecting people with nature using technology responsibly. And I accomplished this in many ways from teaching lessons on how to digiscope, taking pictures through binoculars or a spotting scope with a phone, or I, using different eBird and iBird apps. So using different apps online to learn and then also share citizen science. And then also through leveraging my, my birding project brand and promoting um, just my story, what I was doing and also different organizations through social media. Um, for example, this post I made uh, during spring migration in May and I wanted to raise awareness of the the spring migrants that were hitting buildings in downtown cities all over the country. And so this post reached uh, close to 9,000 people during the time that I shared that on Facebook. So it was really neat to be able to play a role in helping people learn about some of the issues that migratory birds face. So some of you might be watching this uh, having done a big year yourself, maybe a county level big year or a state big year or even a backyard big year. Others of you may have done an ABA big year or a global big year. And some of you may not even know what a big year is. So a big year essentially is a competition, a birding competition that starts January 1st and ends on the last day of the year at midnight. And it's to the goal is to see the highest number of bird species as possible in that calendar year in whatever given geographic area you're focusing on. And so my goal for my big year was to learn more about birds and birders because I knew that on a budget I couldn't control how many birds I would be able to see and traveling to see individual rarities can get expensive really fast. So I set a reasonable goal of 700 as a secondary objective to try and see most of the birds in my bird book in one year. And then I also had my birding project goal to engage, preserve, inspire, and connect people. So my strategy as a bigger birder was to drive to as many rare birds as I could. I got off to a great start in January, going after some of the higher coded birds. So the American Birding Association ranks birds by abundance and assigns them codes for the ABA area. So I use that as a guide to chase birds that were vagrants or accidental uh, occurrences within the geographic boundaries of uh, the US and Canada. So I say North America, but a big year, a North American ABA big year does not include Mexico. I would hope to stop and work when I ran out of money, which I did multiple times. I work near areas with vagrants. So I mentioned I was in Georgia and that allowed me to travel to Florida to be within driving distance if a rarity showed up, which happened several times. So I was able to see the Zenaida dove right after it was reported in Florida by taking some time off work and driving down to see that. And then as the year went on, I raised funds to travel up to Alaska and was able to return to Alaska mul multiple times in order to see rare birds or range restricted birds that uh, reside in Alaska. And then I tried to cut costs wherever I could by driving when it was possible, sleeping in my car and eating cheap food. Being young, um, I wasn't too health conscious. So I was able to eat food that wasn't very healthy, that was cheaper. 
So part of the birding project, my focus at the beginning of the year was to interview birders. And I set a goal of interviewing 365 birders, which averaged one per day. I ended up passing that and interviewing close to 400 birders, but not each day. So some days I was around many people and would stop and ask them questions. I asked questions such as, what was your spark bird? How did you get started birding? What advice would you give to young birders? What's your favorite bird? And I also, also just ask open-ended questions like, tell me a story about a bird that's important to you. And I recorded these, these responses with their permission and then photographed the hands and binoculars of each person that I spoke with. And so this kind of gave me a neat snapshot of uh, birders in North America in that year. And I talked to people of all ages, all ethnicities, um, and it was just really neat to see the diversity that birding is representing and also to see historically what that was like in 2016 and now see the increased diversity from when I did my big year to who I see and who I talk to now when I go out and go birding. So there's kind of four big year birders that I wanted to focus on, one being myself uh, in my story of our budget big year in 2016. I was accompanied by Olaf Danielson or Bradley, Dan Brad Bad <laughs> Bradley McDonald. Um, not used to saying his name because um, he just went by Olaf. Laura Keene and John Weigel. And together the four of us all attempted to do big years with different objectives, different budgets, different goals. But we ultimately ran into each other a lot. And some of those uh, connections were harmonious and others were not, but I got along with everybody else. And so I saw the blue-footed booby with Olaf. Um, I went to Attu with Laura and John, which is where we met. And so it was really neat to be able to have um, fellow friends. Everybody became my friend and comrades in our birding journey over the course of the year. There's nothing truly like a big year to bond you through shared adversity. So in looking at some of the numbers, some of the statistics, I get asked these questions a lot. And since I'm not a, a numbers guy, I like to share some of these statistics with people. Um, I calculated distances using my iPhone, which tracked how far I walked. I kept a pretty meticulous spreadsheet of the birds that I photographed, although it wasn't my goal to photograph every bird. I realized later in the year that I hadn't taken pictures of some common birds I saw earlier in the year. So that's why I didn't photograph 100% of all of the birds that I saw. I spent almost two months in Alaska, birded every state except Hawaii, had uh, many oil changes, a couple of times getting pulled over, no flat tires, believe it or not, with uh, over 60,000 miles of driving and no car accidents and definitely no regrets. There's some other statistics that I offer um, in the appendix of my book as well, which I'll mention a little later. One fascinating thing about big year travel is you spend a lot more time on boats and I was prone to getting seasick, which I overcame during my big year. So talking about bonding through shared adversity, um, getting on a boat for the first time and not feeling well and then having to mentally work through that and physically work through that was a challenge in and of itself. I spent about a month at sea over the course of the year, so 30 days and 20 nights spent on boats. So that difference was uh, boat trips I took out of California or Maine going after specific birds or going out to islands during the day. Looks like some of my uh, text here is cut off a little bit, but I went to uh, Canada on a repositioning cruise leaving New York City in October. I spent time also uh, in California doing boat trips in August in California, North Carolina, July, San Diego, up, offshore California to the, cha the Channel Islands. In June, I spent time in Maine, May, I took a boat out to the island of Attu in Alaska, and then April, I went to the Dry Tortugas. And so I've kind of chosen those, um, those separate corners of the continent to share a little bit more about with you guys tonight. As far as budget birding, I'll touch on birding on a budget in a couple different ways tonight. 
But the repositioning cruise that I took from Los Angeles up to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia was a fantastic trip. There were many other birders other than me that had selected this repositioning cruise, which is a cruise that isn't fully occupied. It's where the cruise company offers really cheap tickets because they've finished one cruise and they're starting another cruise in a different port. So they need to move the boat and all of the uh, employees and entertainers and whatever guests would like to pay to ride along from one port to another. And so the tickets were really cheap. And the timing during the day was right along some of the offshore um, deep water trenches, which attract a lot of marine life, including seabirds that you can only see offshore. I didn't know this. Somebody had given me a tip in February saying, if you're doing a big year, you need to be on this boat, like this particular one, the Ruby Princess. And so I made reservations, didn't know how I was going to pay for it, but put it on a credit card and hope that um, things would work out, which they did. So it's a four day cruise, three nights. Um, after living out of my car for a couple of months, this was heaven. I loved uh, having a, a real bed, having all you can eat buffets. I ate pizza. I, I ate salmon and sushi and cruise ships. If you haven't been on one, have everything under the sun, which was so much fun after coming on a budget to uh, be on board a boat with just everything as far as amenities. I saw about 25 new species of birds during this repositioning cruise trip. Some were on shore, many were offshore, and then some like the Eurasian Skylark, I got off the boat when it stopped in Victoria, British Columbia, and had a trip lined up with some local birders that were going to go chase it, and they offered to take me along. So I got the, the Eurasian Skylark uh, in British Columbia. And this broke down to about $2.54 per bird or $63 a day. So this was by far the best value of my money and one of the lowest costs per birds after I got above 300 species. Um, individual birds started to get expensive. So for birding on a budget, a repositioning cruise cannot be beat. And if you're interested in what some of those species were, I am offering some of the highlights that I took uh, with my iPhone, DigiScope through binoculars or my spotting scope. We have both species of albatross uh, on the left, black-footed and laysan. The middle bird is a Hawaiian petrel, pretty rare to see offshore uh, the mainland United States in the Pacific Ocean. And then uh, Cooks and Murphy's petrels. So I believe that that's a Cooks petrel. Um, just because I saw all the birds doesn't mean I still recognize and know every bird intimately. Some of these birds I saw just once during that year and haven't seen since. So I'm no by no means an expert in all things bird identification because I've seen the birds once before. And so I continue to be uh, a student of, of birding, observing bird behavior and learning bird identification better. And that's something that everyone's working on. And then the last bird on the right is a South Polar skua, really chunky big bird. I saw lots of different uh, amazing wildlife offshore through all of my boat trips, a uh, dead sperm whale in Alaska. I watched gulls eating auklets, which is pictured here, kind of gruesome, but I learned how, how deadly gulls can be. I saw many different species of flying fish out in the Gulf Stream off, the sh off of uh, Hatteras, North Carolina. And then I saw an uh, elephant seal in, near the Channel Islands that had been killed and partially eaten by great white sharks. And we stuck around in the boat waiting to see if the white sharks would come back because that's something else that was on my bucket list was to see great white sharks in the wild. And uh, sadly, that didn't come to pass. So. Guadalupe Island in Mexico is on my bucket list to do cage diving someday in the future. Looking at flying on a budget, I went 129 days without flying from January to May. Um, and I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find another big year birder that has gone so long without flying. Um, it's possible. There's lots of different takes and more people have done big years since 2016. So it's possible that uh, Jeremy or Dano may have may have driven and not flown for that chunk of time. I took almost 50 individual flight legs. A lot of those were going through multiple airports to get to a destination. My longest flight was Anchorage to Chicago. Overnight, I slept on the plane. Shortest flight was from Nome to Kotzebue, Alaska to chase the gray-headed chickadee that had been reported. And uh, I may have caught a glimpse of that. I slept three nights on airplanes. 
and Alaska Airlines. I'm a little biased, but I love Alaska Airlines because my dad, once he retired from the Navy, got a job with Alaska Airlines. And so although I wasn't able to fly free on Alaska Airlines, I was able to fly on buddy passes or standby passes from my dad and other friends that I have that work for the airlines. So that allowed me to travel as well as donated air miles and travel credits and uh, the Alaska Airlines credit card, which is probably one of my, my biggest tips I tell people who want to travel is if you have to spend money, put it on a credit card, um, get airline miles for it, and then pay off your credit card quickly because otherwise um, they get you and that's how credit card works. So while flying, bringing your own food can save you a lot of money using a reusable water bottle. Um, I purchased refundable flights to Florida during spring break, knowing that they're going to overbook and then they offer to buy your ticket back from you for more than you paid. And so I've made money selling tickets back to the airlines that I didn't ever intend to travel on. Being nice to flight attendants is crucial. I have flight attendants give me free food just for saying hello, asking them how their day was going. Um, and knowing mutual friends also helped when I was flying on Alaska Airlines. Um, the frequent flyer program I mentioned is awesome. And then traveling with friends, Alaska Airlines, when you sign up for their uh, visa card, they offer a buddy pass. And uh, that allows you to bring a friend for $99 on the same itinerary as you. And I was able to work with other big year birders. I'd pay for a ticket and they would fly with me on one chase and then they'd buy a ticket on their Alaska Airlines card and bring me with them on a different chase. So it's always better when you work together. So some of the birds that I saw on my big year um, was just incredible. The diversity was amazing. I had 343 species in Texas. And so some states have a really high biodiversity. Other states don't have uh, as many birds. And so I spent less time in some of the states that I'd already seen birds in other states that lived like in Kentucky. I'm sorry if anyone's listening from Kentucky, but I drove through Kentucky once and only saw an eBirded three species. Um, I had four herd only birds during 2016, which I made a goal in the years since to go back and try and see those birds. And some of them like boreal owl would be a lifer bird for me. I'd never, never seen it and I'd never heard it before 2016 and just hearing it wasn't satisfactory to me. So I went back and got this picture of a boreal owl after that um, in Washington just, just recently. So by bird numbers, um, and I ended up passing my goal of 700. Um, that's not a spoiler alert, but I, I ended the year with 752 species and plus a provisional and the list numbers change a little bit over the years. And then I had about 12 birds that I believe I saw, but I wasn't 100% sure. And so I didn't count birds that I was not 100% sure on their identification. So about 12 or 13 species that were I most likely saw and I believe that I saw, but I didn't include them on my official list since I wanted the, the integrity of my big year to be um, unchallenged. So during my big year, I was majoring in education and innovation with an emphasis in uh, education for global sustainability. And so this was my master's program. And so the reason I was stopping at McDonald's uh, every day was to do my classes online and to turn in assignments and to continue going with my graduate degree program until I had to choose, do I pay for grad school or do I pay for my big year? And I made the choice to hit the pause button on grad school and to continue doing my big year. And so as part of my graduate program, I did a carbon audit of my big year and used a couple different carbon calculators and figured out the approximate carbon footprint of all the travel that I did in spreadsheets, adding up miles driven, um, the average uh, carbon footprint of the public transportation I use, the boats by miles, the cruise ships. Um, and then I also did the math for the home energy audit. And because I was living in my car most of the time or spent just brief times with other people, um, I calculated all of this and 
decided to purchase a carbon offset following my big year to try and set a precedent for having a carbon negative big year, which means that I invested in different programs, local programs in the United States that plant trees or um, work on capturing methane from landfills in order to develop sustainable energy and reduce the carbon footprint of those different projects. And then I also invested in um, carbon credits through LifeStraw for uh, a program in Kenya. And I purchased more carbon offsets than the carbon footprint that I calculated of myself to allow for a little bit of wiggle room and hope that by doing this, I'd set an example for birders doing big years to follow that um, could be more aware of our collective carbon footprint as birders. So it's not a, a necessary activity, but it's something that we all enjoy doing. And it's something that's really carbon intensive, especially if you're flying a lot or driving a lot in order to see birds. So I'm hoping that raising awareness for the carbon footprint of our hobbies um, can lead more people to work towards protecting the resources that we love and the bird habitat and the birds themselves. So the whole reason we're going out to see birds is to, to see them and enjoy them. And we want to be sure that our activities are uh, protecting them and not destroying their habitat or making um, amplifying climate change, which I'll speak on a little bit more. So on the note of budget birding, just taking a look at how I ate on a budget, I often shopped at discounted grocery stores that either sold damaged food or food that was about to expire. So I wasn't shopping at uh, Whole Foods or some of the, the more expensive grocery stores. I tried to buy food from uh, like grocery outlet or other local um, grocery stores that I could find. I foraged for a lot of my food when I was out birding and encountered edible plants and wild mushrooms. And uh, I'd grown up and read a lot of books about wilderness survival and about edibles. And so I was able to eat um, huckleberries in Montana, wild blueberries in Alaska. Um, I dined with different birders that I met who had caught fresh salmon and uh, I ate raspberries. That picture was from Southern Arizona during the summer. So it's really neat to be able to shop local, both by foraging food and then also buying fruit from fruit stands on the side of the road in some of the near tropical zones in South Texas and in Florida, and to really try and uh, save money, but also uh, eat healthy and fresh food. I tried to use coupons. There were a number of different promotions going on from the McDonald's Monopoly promotion, which I just happened to be in McDonald's a lot. And uh, although I try not to eat there very often in my regular life, uh, on my big year, that was easy, cheap, and allowed me to, to get access to Wi-Fi. So I won a lot of free food during the Monopoly promotion and was able to use those tickets to get more free food, which also had uh, free food tickets on them. So it's just a, a nice cycle of you kind of buy into it and then you get lots of free food. I think Chipotle was also uh, being questioned. They had some health food scares, so they were offering free burritos. And so I signed up with multiple email addresses and asked my friends and family to, to sign up for the, the Chipotle free burrito coupons. And I ate Chipotle burritos for a long time um, for free because they were trying to win back customers after losing them to the, the food scare. And then finally, enjoying life, just kind of um, a pun with the cereal, but I ate a lot of cereal, a lot of oatmeal, and a lot of ramen. So just the, the finer things in life, enjoying those foods. Sleeping on a budget. Um, as far as people asking me, how do I, I travel and sleep on a budget? I say do whatever's most comfortable for you and your body, because we're all different. Obviously, being a 26-year-old a um, young adult, I could sleep on hard surfaces on the ground in the back of my car. I tried to pad the back of my car and sleep on blankets and sleeping bags. But um, when you're 60 or 70, it's tough to sleep in a car. And so I'd say the ABCs, you can try and sleep in a friend's guest room. You could try and stay in a budget-friendly motel. Or lastly, camping. If you have the adequate gear, which I did being a wildlife cinematographer before my big year, that's why you see pictures of me with giant camera lenses and uh, expensive equipment. That's because I'd spent the years leading up to my big year investing in the right equipment to do all of these things. And that carried me into my big year. And I ended up selling different camera equipment and uh, other things to make money to keep my journey going. And so 
my gear, some of it evolved and changed as I swapped things out or bought and sold things to, to make money. As far as car camping tips, I slept uh, in parking lots and different vacant spaces all over the country. Walmart parking lots were by far the most convenient. Um, being able to uh, look up online which Walmarts allowed parking and which ones didn't. You could also ask local managers and they knew. And so I'd park in Walmart lots, brush my teeth using my water bottle, buy whatever I needed or resupply while I was there, use the bathroom, and then continue driving the next day. Other ideas for birding on a budget, um, being able to ask yourself the question of what choice am I making? Um, pursuing things that bring you joy. If it doesn't bring you joy and you can do without it, maybe that's something you can cut out of your travel or your routine or your diet or um, what you're used to. And so for me, I tried to ask myself the, the questions of, do I need this or do I want it? And develop an attitude of gratitude look at the things that I had and be grateful for those versus the things that I didn't have and really want those. Because birding on a budget to me meant um, being happy and content with where I was and trying to figure out how I could do more with less. All right, so I'd like to focus just a little bit quickly on some of the, the places that I went. I'd love to give more attention to every place I went and their stories and birds and people I met that I'd love to tell, but we just don't have enough time for all of that tonight. So I thought I'd focus on a couple different places in Alaska. Alaska is a huge state and uh, I, I can recommend if you go to Alaska, try and combine multiple locations, especially coming from the East Coast, which many of you uh, listening tonight are from the East Coast, getting to Alaska is a haul. So if you can get to Alaska, it's best to, if you're able to combine multiple destinations. Obviously, Attu is no longer in the, the grasp of a lot of um, birders, especially if you're on budget. They don't fly planes out there anymore. So you have to fly to the island of Adak, which is serviced by Alaska Airlines, and then take a, a boat for a couple days out to the island of Attu. Gamble is also on uh, an island on St. Lawrence Island. So Gamble is a town on the kind of northwest point of the island, so super close to Russia. On a clear day, you can actually look across and see the mountains of, of Russia. And then Nome's on the Seward Peninsula. And so there's lots of great birds in Alaska, uh, fantastic habitat, amazing things to see. The boat ride from uh, Adak to Attu is uh, Several, several days, 437 miles, which uh, at just a couple miles per hour is a, a long kind of bumpy trip. And so I thought I'd sh share with you what that ride looks like. So that's on a calm day. Um, you can see the chop still is, is pretty rough. But we were on the, a boat called the Pukuk and made our way out to Attu by boat, sleeping on the boat each night. And then during the day, we took a little a skiff to shore and then hiked or biked around the parts of um, the, the accessible parts of Attu. It's a, a pretty big island, so we were only birding and covering a small percentage of the island, kind of this, this one cove. Attu is an island with so much history. It's actually the only part of the United States that was invaded by the Japanese during World War II. And so we had uh, almost 550 Americans lose their lives and 2,400 Japanese soldiers who lost their lives fighting for control of Attu. And so the uh, Japanese army invaded Attu and then we sent uh, very unprepared forces to take Attu back. and. Uh, some of the, the bloodiest battles um, in Attu were, were fought you know, on the same ground that we were birding. And so it didn't take much to look around Attu while we were birding and see remnants from uh, the military occupation from both forces here. And so here's a, a tank chassis that's uh, at the high tide line, machine gun ramparts. Walking around Attu was quite dangerous if you weren't paying attention to where you were looking. There were areas with unexploded ordnance left over. Um, so you had to be careful where you went and be aware that there, um, you're walking on a, a historical battlefield. And so 
there's uh, airplane wrecks in the mountains. Um, I found pickaxes and different tools that literally soldiers had dropped. Um, this is just a snapshot of what Attu sounds like. You'll hear a song sparrow sing at the end of this, this little clip. Cackling geese. So that song sparrow sounds really different. You heard cackling geese in the background, glaucus swing gulls. Um, it's just really a, a magical and amazing place, even though it had a, a very rough history. Um, even before that, there there's a history of uh, native Alaskans that lived there that were um, kind of commandeered by the Russians and enslaved. So there's a, a very long history of people living on Attu. And now it's really wild and overgrown. Um, pretty rough. You can see the scale of people to some of these mountains that come straight out of the ocean there. The Coast Guard abandoned their base there um, maybe 25 years ago, 20 years ago maybe, if my memory serves correct. And so the runway's really kind of failing, falling apart, getting covered with moss and lichen. Um, and I tried to hike around and get away from the water's edge and go up into the mountains in pursuit of some of the harder to find species on Attu. I climbed up one mountain all the way to the top above the clouds looking for the Everman subspecies of rock ptarmigan, which is endemic. It's only found on the island of Attu. And uh, when Russian fur traders introduced foxes to the islands, um, the other islands around Attu, this, this species went extinct, so it was uh, still persisting on Attu, and wildlife biologists have reintroduced uh, this species to other surrounding islands, and uh, I was able to find it and photograph it on the island of Attu and make some recordings. It has a really neat call. So people are wondering, why do you even go to Attu to do a big year? If you've seen the big year movie, you'll recognize that there's so many potential vagrants, rare birds from Asia that show up um, in Attu and then also in Western Alaska. So from the common sandpiper to the common cuckoo, things that have common in their name but are very uncommon in North America. The Siberian ruby throat in the upper right-hand corner and our uh, great knot and lesser sand plover. So two mega rarities, um, both side by side on Attu. So it's a lot of slow birding for some fast birding. Usually after the storms, the birding really picks up. There's a rich birding history on Attu. Um, there were a couple decades where uh, Attuers Inc., a company led birders out there and people would record their numbers that they saw and their names on the walls. That history is currently being lost due to the wind, the dampness, the weather, but it was really neat to see some of the names that I recognize on here from uh, kind of the, the archives of birding. Uh, Benton Basham is up there. He was the president of the ABA. Sandy Comito is the real life birder portrayed by Owen Wilson in the Big Year movie, Bostick. And then you might recognize some other names here from people that you've, uh, you've heard or maybe are friends with in the birding community. At the end of the trip, we also added our names to the walls and our totals uh, of the birds. So walking around Attu, you never know what you might run into. There's birds like bramblings that just while birding on my own, I would see a brambling. And that not only was a life bird, um, but to find my own was really exciting, separate from the group. And to we all saw them later on, but it was fun to see birds and be able to photograph them on my own that I had never even dreamed I would see uh, on the North American continent. And then a Far Eastern curlew was on ADAC when we got back from our trip to Attu. Moving a little further north to the Seward Peninsula and the, the mining western frontier town of Nome, um, where there's a modern day gold rush in Nome, super cool kind of old frontier town. There's only three roads that leave the town of Nome out into the, the tundra 
gnome sits just below the Arctic Circle. So um, these willow bushes are about as tall as you see until you get up into the mountains where there's trees. Um, lots of really cool birds that are only found there. Many cool animals, uh, wolves, wolverines, grizzly bears, moose, uh, muskox, like this one I photographed here. Birds like the Arctic warbler on the left and the uh, Eastern yellow wagtail are birds that a birder has to go to Nome to see. They don't occur anywhere else on the continent. There's many different habitats here that include um, kind of wet tundra ponds, saltwater lagoons. There's some boreal forest. If you drive out the uh, on one of the roads, you can see rare birds. I ran into this common ringed plover, which I studied and was looking at other plovers, semi-palmated plovers, and was ready to, to find one that was different. And I did on my big ear, which is really exciting. Um, there's deer falcons nesting in gnomes, so a bird that would be really rare in the lower 48 during the winter time was common in breeding in Alaska, so that's one reason to, to make the investment to get up there. Birds like long-tailed duck that we usually see in their winter plumage, it's fun to see breeding in the summer, and these are birds that have never before likely seen people, and so they're uh, very accommodating. And birds like this Sabin's gull uh, in full breeding plumage and the long-tailed Jaeger in the top. Gnome's just super biodiverse and amazing. Utkagvik, uh, which it used to be called Barrow, but it was recently renamed, I think during 2016, actually, that, that name change happened. One uh, Inupiat translation of uh, Barrow or Utkagvik means the place where snowy owls are hunted. And so they definitely have a, a rich tradition of, of hunting, both for food and uh, for their, for kind of native Alaskan ceremonies and uh, to support their cultural beliefs. And so being at the top of the world and realizing my bucket list dream to see polar bears in the wild um, was super amazing. It was also disheartening to see uh, the effects of climate change. So the sea levels have risen, I, the Arctic sea ice is melting and uh, the, this town literally is on the, the precipice of eroding into the ocean. So some of their buildings are, um, as you can see, not very far from that coastal erosion that's going on. So seeing polar bears and not just like the poster child for climate change polar bears that are skin and bones on an iceberg all by themselves. These polar bears were fat, healthy, many had multiple cubs, and it was really an encouraging experience for me to see happy and healthy polar bears on the outskirts of Utkiagvik. Heading to Florida where there's countless stories, but I wanna be mindful of time and leaving question time at the end of my talk tonight. I'll share just a little bit with you about the Dry Tortugas, which is as far away from Utkiagvik as you can get in the ABA birding area for the American Birding Association. You have to take a high-speed catamaran ferry from Key West, Florida, and you're only about 80 miles from Cuba on Key West, where it's a national park. So Dry Tortugas National Park includes the historic Fort Jefferson. And this is a, a picture I borrowed from visitflorida.com, which shows an aerial view of Fort Jefferson, a Civil War area fort, uh, which was constructed and not used much past the Civil War, but is now a historic monument. I think it's most famous for Dr. Samuel Mudd, um, who was captured and in prison there for a while. The birding history of this small island is, is really neat, just to see all of the migrant birds in the spring and the fall, and I went during the springtime, where all of these migrant birds would uh, fly from the Yucatan across the Gulf of Mexico. And before they hit Florida, many of these birds would see this small green island and come down from uh, their migration and stop here and drink fresh water from the bubbler. So we have a Cape May warbler and an indigo bunting. And as you'd bird around the fort, you would just find these birds that had fallen out of the sky and were there to uh, rest and, and try and find food and get energy to continue the last leg of their migration. This is a prairie warbler, yellow-billed cuckoo. Not all birds made it, so the falcons were hanging out there and they would uh, sit on the radio towers and fly off over the ocean and capture terns or capture uh, incoming passerines. Cuckoos were a favorite of the falcons. I watched multiple yellow-billed cuckoos get eaten while I was there. And then uh, the solitary sandpiper didn't make it. So it made it to the island, but then 
couldn't find enough food to survive and replace the fat it had lost to finish its journey. And like I said, some days I saw multiple falcons, uh, six or seven peregrines of different ages and sexes, merlins and American kestrels all in this small area inside the fort. My interest in going there was to see birds that could only be found in this corner of the continent, specifically tropical seabirds, like the, the sooty tern, um, bridal tern, and uh, masked booby, brown noddies, and then the occasional, um, very rare and tough to see, hard to pick out the black noddy, which is the right bird on this coaling dock. It has a kind of whiter cap and longer, thinner bill than the brown noddy on the left. So I really lucked out to go out there. None had been reported yet in 2016. And I, I was able to camp there for a couple nights and look for black knotty, which I was able to find. And then the nearby hospital key has nesting mask boobies. So the mask boobies, the frigate birds, uh, the, the noddies, the terns, all only nest in this kind of tropical little corner of the American Birding Association area. So some takeaways from my big year, um, there's many different ways to bird. There's different birders. You could literally uh, never reach the end of describing birders. Um, they come in so many different shapes and sizes. Um, I met so many different amazing people and gathered their stories. It's a whole nother presentation to share the stories and the answers to the interview questions. But um, there's just so many different ways to enjoy birds. And that's what I realized. And none of them are better than the others. They're just all different. Birding is really better done with other people. And while some of us may enjoy the isolation and the quiet time just surrounded by nature, after birding for an entire year, I had plenty of that. But I also realized that there's life and energy and uh, excitement to be drawn from birding with other people. And everybody was a new birder once. And so having the compassion to uh, overcome the, the quirks or idiosyncrasies of, of people that we spend a lot of time with that might be uh, interesting or different from ourselves can really help us build that tolerance and uh, build that sense of community with other people who love the same thing that we do, which is watching birds. This is my short time to promote uh, my book. I during my year, I wrote on my iPhone and on my computer and just kind of captured my story since my birding project blog was largely telling other people's stories until people that I was running into said, hey, you need to share a little bit about your story. We want to follow you and know what you're doing. And so that's when I took some of the writings that I had written and published them on my blog. And then everything that I didn't, I kind of held on to and wrote my book, Falcon Freeway, which is a, a tribute to Kingbird Highway. Um, my big year was very different than Ken Coffin's, but the highways had become freeways. My spark bird being a peregrine falcon, I thought that was a nice uh, tribute to pay to him and asked his permission to uh, give him a nod in my book. And, and he gladly endorsed my book and uh, was a part of my story. And as well as books that you can buy um, on my website, thebirdingproject.com. And uh, I package and ship those. So I published on a budget. It's not the a perfect literary work, but it is my story in uh, most of its entirety. And my friend Andrew Gutenberg illustrated it, and he's a talented wildlife artist that I interviewed. He lives in Montana. He's younger than me. And uh, looking at this common parake, I was able to tell Andrew and describe these stories that I had and, and share with him some of my images like this one. And he was able to turn those into works of art and original pen and ink drawings, which I requested since Ken Kaufman had also, and Roger Tory Peterson to had pen and ink drawings. So I thought sticking with that, that common thread for the big year narrative, I wanted my drawings to, um, not my own, because I'm not that talented, but I wanted my story to, to be communicated with these wonderful drawings. And so I've taken these memories and, and had those put in my book. So if nothing else, there's a fun collection of artwork in my story as well. Almost here at an hour. So thank you all so much for being an engaged audience. I look forward to uh, seeing what questions you have and look forward to connecting with you. You can reach me at thebirdingproject.com or thebirdingproject at gmail.com. And uh, I look forward to hearing your story and hopefully birding with you in the future out in the field somewhere around our wonderful continent. 
thanks so much for being an amazing audience tonight. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Great. So hi, everybody. I'm Gabriel Willow, uh, Vice President of the Linnaean Society of New York. Um, and thank you so much, Christian, for, for that presentation. That was really exciting to travel with you uh, around the country. And on the, your, the cover of your book there, was that Peregrine Falcon, did that happen to be flying over a corner of New York City, perhaps? It sure did. It was important to me for the, the cover of my book to not be a photoshopped image. And so uh, Patrick Cashin, who's a photographer, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, um, was on the top of Nags Head Bridge and uh, they were banding peregrine falcons. And so the, the cover of my book is one of the parent falcons, likely the female flying in and harassing them as they're banding the chicks. And so that's not okay. photoshopped, but it's yeah. the, whole, the whole book, you open it up and it's one image of, of that bridge in New York with the peregrine falcon. I wasn't sure which, but yeah, we have, we, they nest on a bunch of bridges around the city. So I wasn't sure, I thought maybe the Verrazano or one of those, but that beautiful shot. Um, so we certainly do have a lot of questions. I'll remind everybody, uh, you can still uh, type your questions into the Q&A. Uh, it's a little button there on the lower right of your screen. And I'm just going to go through and, and see what people, uh, what people want to know. So um, I'll sort of start towards the beginning of your presentation. I guess you can see the questions as well, Christian, but I'm happy to go through. Um, so someone was curious who shot the video uh, for, that was Maven, right? That, that was the company that did that. But yeah, who was, who was out there following you around? Yeah, so I, I spent a couple of days in Wyoming meeting the crew at Maven, and I, I sold my Swarovski optics and used those funds to continue birding and affording food and gas and travel, and uh, Maven sponsored me. And so they gave me optics, and they also gave me some promotional support. So I drove up there to thank them in person. This had all been arranged online. Um, they sent me binoculars, and I, I met them in Wyoming at their headquarters based here in the US and uh, went out birding with them and, and met their crew. They took me out to dinner. They let me stay at their houses. And so wow. I kind of rotated through um, meeting them and kind of hearing their story and they connected with my story. And uh, they introduced me to some sage grouse biologists. So that's how I got onto the Lex and those big trucks. And wow. I, I interviewed sage grouse biologists. So I had one of the, the visual media um, employees at Maven who followed me around riding with me just locally in the area for a couple of days and we went birding together and he he filmed that and and produced that video to help oh, wow. reach to help my story reach a broader audience it was very like professionally and polished looking though they he was good they did a great job Beautiful. that's yeah Cra craig okraska was his name did he's uh on instagram and uh just a, a fantastic artistic eye amazing person yeah i wonder how many folks watching the presentation tonight were uh uh uh, Googling like uh, how to get to a, uh, a sage grouse lek or or the uh, repositioning cruises. I was definitely like note taking notes. Yeah, repositioning cruise. I got to remember that. Or I guess I can uh, get your book and then I won't have to uh, look at my scribbled notes here. Um, now this is something we discussed uh, a little earlier before the presentation started. Um, a possible answer to this, but uh, someone asks: Are there any women who have done a big year? Great question. That's a fantastic question. During 26, well, I'll, I'll back up beyond. I, I'm not like a big year historian, so there's better people than me to answer this. But um, the first woman, woman that I know who did a big year in the ABA area was Lynn Barber. And she was a Texas birder. She now lives in Alaska. And so she did an ABA big year and then has done in a lot, multiple Alaska big years and written books. So you can check out Lynn Barber's books. Um, and then Laura Keene was... Um, the birder, the female birder who did a big year in 2016. And we spent time together and met uh, on the Atu trip. And she, she ended up being more places with me in the field than my mom. And so she kind of became my, my surrogate mom, my birding mom. And, uh, and so we traveled together a lot in the, in the remaining months of the year and cost shared and uh, flight shared and, and spent a lot of time together helping each other find the birds that we needed and, it, and those ended up lining up. So Laura was a big year birder in 2016. Since then, uh, I know currently Tiffany Kirsten is doing a big year. And so she's doing a big year this year, just a lower 48 big year. So kind of uh, a different focus, not trying to jet back and forth between Alaska, but focusing on birds in the lower 48. 
And so she's doing a big year uh, this year and has is within sight of the record for the lower 48. And so you can definitely Google her or check her out at Nature Ninja Birding Tours. Just a, a fantastic woman, um, excellent birder, and uh, a real treat to bird with her if you get the chance. Yeah, and she also has partnered with this. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, taking her out to a couple spots in the in the city and found two new birds for her big year uh, just a couple weeks ago. But she's also partnered with this company called Birdie that makes alarms uh, for uh, women or really whomever to carry mm -hmm. if you're out somewhere you don't feel totally safe. And then she hands them out to uh, folks she meets, um, but particularly to create a, a feeling of, of security and safety for women who might be out hiking and birding and stuff like that. So that's pretty sure. cool. So. Yeah, I, she's doing something cool. I know uh, Evie Morell has done a big year, Nicole Kotzlau, and then Tammy McQuaid and Gailey Dean. So there's been a number of birders recently as I kind of like finish my big year and unplugged from the birding scene a little bit. Um, but if you if you look at big year on Wikipedia, there's a, a list of, of female birders and people who have, have done big years recently. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I was wondering, you mentioned like just now sort of, stepping away a little bit from the, the birding uh, scene. Did you get birding burnout after this big year? Did you have to, did you like not want to look at a bird for some months or afterwards? No? <laughs> no. Um, on January 1st, I, I actually spent the night in Boston on December 31st looking for dove key on the last day of the year. And I'd seen a dove key uh, and it was, it was, I saw it simultaneously with another Massachusetts birder offshore race point. And we both saw it and he's like, that's it. And I'm like, that is a small black and white thing and then it dove. And I didn't even know which direction it was facing. So I didn't count it, it, it still eludes me. Um, I believe I saw it, but um, couldn't identify it on my own. So uh, I spent the night in Boston at the airport and then January 1st woke up and went birding <laughs> and, and kept looking for dove keys and enjoying harlequin ducks and purple sandpipers and uh, just all the wonderful East Coast winter birds. And so I definitely didn't get burned out. Um, I, I, I thrive birding. I love being out in nature, love learning things. And that journey doesn't end. And so I, I love birding and I had to take a month off from work in January. I didn't go back to teaching right away. I took a month just to kind of like get the pace of life back to normal. And I weaned myself from birding a lot down to only birding a little bit. So when I started work in February, um, I still birded every day, but just a little bit less intensely and more locally. And I've been birding since, just not a uh, competitive listing. So I kind of have scratched that itch for me and I don't continue yeah. to fly to far flung corners of the continent just to pursue a single bird. Unless the caveat for me is if I can combine that with something else or I'm already there and a, a new ABA bird shows up for me or a life bird, um, so this year it was the Inca turn in Hawaii and I was able to fly to Hawaii to dive with the manta rays, which was yeah. a bucket list trip that and, amazing. Yeah. and the Inca turn was there. And so I was able to, to do Perfect. both of those things, use air miles, um, stay at a budget hotel. And so that trip was like $400. Yeah. Previously, Hawaii wasn't part of the ABA area, right? It was Canada and the United States and in Alaska, but not Hawaii, but now it is part of the ABA area, right? So are people doing big years now flying out to Hawaii too, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I've, I've, change. I've been to Hawaii after the ABA added it. And it was really important for me under the umbrella of the birding project to tell the stories of native Hawaiian birds. Because if you think about birds going extinct, we think yeah. of, oh, well, tropical rainforest or birds that are, you know, small populations somewhere else in the world. But we have one of the highest extinction rates uh, in the world on, on the islands, uh, the Hawaiian islands, with yeah. birds being driven towards extinction due to introduced uh, rats and mongoose and uh, mosquitoes carrying avian malaria. So climate change and deforestation and introduced species like Hawaiian birds are being hit from every, every angle. And there's lots yeah. of introduced species there, but the native birds in Hawaii are amazing. And I wanted to see them before they're gone and tell the stories of some of these birds. And so I've yeah. been to Hawaii uh, to almost all of the islands and, wow. and just, and just relished in all of the birds there and volunteered on Kauai to ban birds, uh, native forest birds and, uh, and learn about them so I can tell their story. That's always been a dream of mine too. I've never been to Hawaii, but since I was a kid, I was like, oh, just the biodiversity there is so incredible. But I also thought 
I've always felt like maybe I'd be a little sad because so many have gone extinct and even in recent times. So I, I've always had sort of mixed feelings, but I, it, is, it is on my bucket list as well. That's nice. And the banding project sounds really cool. It's super, it's super sad uh, and emotional, but if I could implore anybody, if, if I was asked the question, like if I could take one trip in the next year, where would I go? Not me, but if people were asking me that question, I would tell them go yeah. to Hawaii. Um, because access is tightening up, the the populations are getting smaller and smaller. And so some of these native Hawaiian honey creepers are becoming really difficult to see. And there's something emotional and moving about seeing a bird that you know it's one of 30. Like there's 30 individuals and you just saw one of them. And they're birds that I know that my my future children aren't going to be able to see unless we pull off some like conservation rabbit out of a hat. Um, and it doesn't doesn't look good, but people are trying. Yeah, yeah. Um, now this this uh, on, a, on a slightly lighter note, uh, yeah. some someone asked, uh, um, and and this relates to maybe how much time you spend birding or not. I don't know, but uh, does your does your wife have any interest in birding? That's a great question. Um, my wife is supportive of birding and she likes birds, but she would not self-identify as a birder. And for me, I love that about her because she loves trees, she loves being outside, she loves hiking. And so I learn things from her all the time. And then I also am able to teach and share what I know with her. So the fact that we don't have a strong overlap makes going out in nature with her exciting every single day. And, and I love it. And so we're not constantly like competing or one-upping each other like I have done with other um, birding girlfriends or friends in the past. And so it's really nice just to have the time that I spend with my wife out in nature be so enjoyable. And we both learn and teach each other every time we go out. Well, well said. Um, uh, this seems like a pretty straightforward question, I think. Um, could you count dead big ear birds as part of your count or do they have to be alive? They have to be alive. And those are the ABA rules. Um, if you count dead birds, I would have been able to add a couple more birds. Um, mm -hmm. I was... I asked at a at the wild bird store on uh, Cape Cod if they'd seen any dove keys or heard of any reports and the owner disappeared into the back he said he said let me check and he comes out and he hands me a, a frozen dove key from the freezer and it had been it had been stranded and and died it, it drowned in a dog bowl that was the only water it could find on land and uh, and it was turned into him to give to a museum collection and he played show and tell. And so I got to hold a dove key and see a dead dove key, but I was not able to count it. Yeah, um, that's a big sort of jinx bird for me in New York. And then a, a friend of mine was walking down the street in Brooklyn, like not even near the water and found a, a, a recently deceased dove key that was still warm. And they picked it up and sent me a photograph. I was like, what's this? Um, and I, I couldn't believe it. I think it was in the neighborhood of Sunset Park. So like sort of near the water, but not fourth or fifth Ave in Brooklyn. And so these things happen sometimes. And it's frustrating that there was like a dove key flying through and also sad for the dove key. But yes, I still haven't seen one uh, in, in New York State. So um, yeah, they're tricky little things. Um, several people have, have uh, noted the, the carbon footprint aspect. And I also thought that was super cool. I, um, I, I, I lead a lot of birding tours and I'm thinking maybe I should add that as an option. Like people could pay a little extra to offset their carbon footprint or something like that. Um, so someone just commented to say that it's uh, a good suggestion. So thank you for that. And then um, there was another question about it. Oh, how do you recommend finding out, like calculating your carbon footprint and then offsetting it? Sure. So there's a number of different software options, um, programs where you can put in miles driven, um, kilowatt hours, you put in zip codes to look at the averages because each person um, can use an incredibly different amount of resources. But when you look at kind of large scale patterns and trends, you can get a, a pretty good average. And so I used a couple different software programs for that and then tried to track my travel and carbon use as much as I could. And it was pretty easy because I spent so much time in my car and sleeping and camping and staying with friends. And it's kind of like a, a little bit of a loophole because staying with somebody overnight, it's like, is my shower or my couple of bites of food from the meal that they cooked on their gas stove? Like, does that really increase their carbon footprint or is their carbon footprint my carbon footprint because I was there? And so yeah. there, there's a little bit of um, uh, kind of like rounding numbers, I guess, for that, because answering the questions and splitting hairs um, 
wasn't worth my time, but being able to get a pretty good idea based on overall how many nights I spent in people's homes versus in my car versus on the road. I had an exact number of miles from driving my Subaru, from driving rental cars, from riding with other people, from uh, miles of uh, planes flown that I calculated each mileage of every flight that I did. So it, it was a lot of accounting and it was all done after the fact. And it took me an entire year of teaching and working and having money to be able to spend in that way. But that was important to me to, to research and invest in a offset program that I could get behind and, and that did work that I believed in. Right. Because I've heard that some are better than others. Like if they're planting a tree, it could be a palm oil plantation or something. like there's no, they, they have to be fairly scrupulous to know like what they're doing. Right. Yes, exactly. And so I, I encourage people to do their own research and not just Google like carbon offsets and whatever ad comes up first, um, but to do research and choose a project that, or choose a company, because oftentimes these companies will have a whole diversity of projects and you need to contact them or specify what you want your money to support and whether it actually does or not is kind of tough to tell. But I tried to invest in companies that had projects, especially like methane capture from landfills that I was like, okay, this, this um, landfill in California, like this is what my money's going to, at least is what they're saying on the website. And I felt better about that than doing something over in India or China or a carbon uh, company that just didn't say what their, where their projects were. Yeah. 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 Sometimes when I purchase airplane tickets, there's an option to tick a little box and purchase a carbon offset for your flight, but they never say where I might just be giving the airline more money for all I know, but I still usually do it. Um, yeah. Uh, do, I don't, you don't have to answer it. Maybe it's in your book. Maybe it's not, but you mentioned it was a year of teaching to like, uh, afford the carbon offset. So uh, yeah, it was, it was, so it was fairly expensive, I guess. The carbon offset, it was, uh, yeah. I'd have to go back and look. It was over, I, I feel like it was between like three and $600. Okay. So, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't terribly expensive, obviously no. purchasing more carbon offsets get more expensive. Um, but I recall it being manageable for only having a year of income under my belt. I was like, okay, yeah. you know, this is important to me. I did it on earth day in 2017. Um, so I, I got back to grad school and re-enrolled in my classes and, uh, and did worked on this offset as part of my, my graduate, uh, work and, and took some of my money and invested that. Mm. Um, fantastic. That's, that's very inspiring. Um, here's a good question. Uh, first of all, that is an anonymous uh, attendee. So I don't know who asked this, but they say it's, this was, your talk was fascinating and inspiring. I would agree. Uh, and two good questions. One, how did you beat your seasickness? And two, as a non driver, they're wondering if you have a recommendation for some great states to bird without a car, except of course, New York, which is New York city is the best place to bird without a car, but, um, yeah. Two, two really good questions. So the first one about beating seasickness, um, everybody's body is different. And I found that um, one of the, the qualities that my big year taught me the most and nurtured within myself was resilience and mental toughness. And I, I'll call it grit. Um, and so I found that largely my seasickness was based on fear. My fear of not feeling well, of missing out, of um, isolation, of being uncomfortable, and I realized that mentally I could I could reflect inwards on my attitude and figure out where that seed was of fear and address that, and then treat those suggestions of fear with counteracting facts about love, of things that I loved, of caring for other people, of seeing birds, and I found kind of this this neat um, treatment where I could affirm the things that I loved and focus on those. And then the fear of getting seasick and missing out kind of disappeared. And the seasickness just stopped. Like I didn't drug myself. I didn't, I just ate normal food and slept on the boat and I was sleeping in the bow, which was uh, a rough part. And so a lot of movement um, in the bow. And so since then, um, just staying hydrated, getting good sleep, just taking care of your body, but then also that mental component of, um, of not being afraid of getting seasick and 
being outside, getting fresh air, um, when I started to feel queasy and just kind of like recalibrating my thought seemed to help. And so I don't know if that's like a spiritual thing or a, um, like a, a Buddhist or meditation kind of thing, but I really found that my thinking played a role in seasickness. And so when I fixed my thinking, the seasickness just disappeared and I haven't been sick on a boat since. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And then good places for birding uh, without a car. So um, that's tricky because you're asking someone who had a car. <laughs> drove everywhere, um, yeah. That, that drove everywhere. But I would say if you could, if you could get to places, um, I, I'd say New York City comes to mind right away um, just because the public transportation and then these kind of islands of habitat which concentrate birds and so if you can get to other places that have those islands of habitat or public transit systems um, yeah. I'm I didn't take a lot of public transportation but in Texas I did like I was in Houston and then I took the bus down to the lower Rio Grande Valley in Brownsville which is like I think four or five hours and so I did take public transit and then I called a friend and I was like, hey, can you pick me up from the bus station? There's this bird. Uh, she was a college classmate. And so she knew my interest in birds from uh, being a bio major in school with me. And so I was like, you know, I'll, I'll treat you to dinner. And this is a really cool bird that's rare and you, you want to come see it too. And so uh, she and a couple of her friends all picked me up and uh, from the bus station and we made a chase out of it. And I got the code five variegated flycatcher after a five hour bus trip. And that was the last it had been seen was we saw it that afternoon and then it was gone. Wow. Wow, that bus got there just yeah. in time. <laughs> yeah, so, so South Texas, like everything in the Rio Grande Valley, there's a lot of great birding locations and there's enough birders that if you don't want to or don't feel comfortable taking public transportation around, you can um, navigate with other birders. It's pretty easy to get on a, a birding Facebook group in the lower Rio Grande Valley and say, hey, I'm birding from out of town. Would anyone want to, you know, would anyone mind if I tagged along and we visited these kind of national wildlife refuges or Texas state parks, or if you don't have a car doing a birding festival is another great way. So a lot of birding festivals provide transportation. So the biggest week in American birding, uh, which is in McGee Marsh in Ohio in the spring during spring migration, they, yep. they have vans. So you pay to attend the festival and then they do all the transportation there. So you get a shuttle from the airport to your festival hotel, and then the festival drives you around to all the locations. So I'd say that's a great investment. The Low Rio Grande Valley Bird Festival also does the same thing in a different area of the country. And then there's a Space Coast Birding Festival in Florida. So there's a list online of all the different birding festivals and birding with other people can be a great way to maximize your bird scene or the places visited if you don't own a car. That is great advice. Yes, that's right. And Cape May Birding Festival, not too far away in New Jersey. And Cape May is also, you can get around. I've gotten around there on bicycle. Um, nice. I'll give a shout out to, uh, to, to whoever asked that question to the uh, Bay Area. Um, I've taken a bus or rented bicycles from San Francisco across the Golden Gate Bridge to the Marin Headlands, which is gorgeous. And I've had like rhinoceros auklid and wandering tattler and uh things that you know black uh, oyster catcher and some cool stuff there on the rocks so that's another pretty public transit friendly area in california um and of course that's another way to keep your carbon footprint low too so that kind of dovetails with the uh the other questions um let me see here what else um oh this is a fun one um uh you've traveled far and wide but is there a local seattle bird or Seattle area bird, which still eludes you, or one that maybe might you think might turn up. So the the might turn up list is is what I would be most interested in. Um, there's birds that I haven't chased in Seattle despite living here, um, and the swallowtailed gull was a recent example of like a first ABA record, first record even in North America of a bird that's normally found in the Galapagos, and I didn't chase it, and mm -hmm. that that's what I I really wasn't trying to, you know, jump on that ba that bandwagon of like, I, I had to recognize after my big year ended that, yeah, I hold, I held a record, but I would, I didn't want to invest the time and money and resources into keeping that record or like continuing to be an ABA lister and keep my list current. Cause that just means chasing a lot of stuff that shows up. So I kind of broke myself of that habit really quickly by not 
chasing the low hanging fruit or the easy birds or birds that I really wanted to see, I'd rather go to the Galapagos and see swallowtailed gull. So even though it was in my, my own backyard, despite I was living and working in Colorado, so it wasn't like a 15 minute drive down the street, like it would be for me now. Um, it was, uh, it was a get on a plane and go home kind of chase, but it just wasn't important enough for me to see that. So to the, the short answer is no, there's no regularly occurring birds in Washington that I haven't seen. There's birds I haven't seen super well that I'd love to see again. And there's of course, uh, vagrants, like we've had a couple emperor geese in Washington this winter, which I've seen multiple times in Alaska, but that's a bird that it showed up like 20 minutes from home. And I was like, Hey, I'll go see if I could, you know, photograph the emperor goose. And, um, so I, I still bird to enjoy it, but there's really nothing new, um, now for me that I can see close to home, unless it's a, you know, really spectacular vagrant or something that's not planned on that shows up in Seattle. Cool. Um, and this will have to be our last question because we're, we're running over time here, but uh, you mentioned photographing the emperor goose and someone did ask, they say you took some amazing photos. How do you balance finding and watching birds with binoculars versus trying to get a good photograph of them? Sure, that, that's a tough call, especially when I was doing a big year and was alone a lot of the time. And so the, bird, the new birds that I was seeing, some of them I'd never seen before. I just studied them in books. And so I took pictures to prove to myself that's what I saw before I try and prove to others. And because I was birding areas I wasn't familiar with, like seeing a, um, you know, a Western kingbird in Virginia as a random example of like, yeah, it's a Western kingbird, I know it, I identified it, but in Virginia, that's a significant record. And so yeah. knowing when to photograph it to, you know, support the eBird sighting uh, was kind of a, a question that I, that I pursued. And uh, early in the year, I had professional level camera equipment from my previous job going into my big year. Um, so I worked on a, a wildlife documentary for PBS on wow. greater prairie chickens. And so I'd invested my money in that job and in that project in my own professional camera equipment. And it was simply big and clunky and hard to carry around. So I took a lot of bird pictures with that at the beginning of the year. And then as I wanted to become more nimble and was more interested in watching bird behavior, I sold that, uh, you know, 500 F4 image stabilized lens and my Canon body and, and downsized to something that was a little bit more um, manageable to carry and document kind of the birds as I saw them. So all the photographs in my presentation are my own um, unless otherwise noted. And I love bird photography. I, I found that that's the way I can share the birds that I see with others and the behavior like those wild turkeys with their necks wrapped around each other. I'd never seen that before and people wouldn't have believed me unless I had photos of it. And so for me, it's a great way to, to study what you see through binoculars. So I often look at a bird through binoculars um, to keep that habit of, of studying the field marks of getting the general impression of the size and the shape of the bird. And then after I get a look at it, I raise my camera because you know, you can spend a, a long time looking through a camera, trying to get the focus right, trying to get the exposure right, the shutter speed, um, and then the bird's gone. And then you don't have a picture and you didn't really see it very well because you're looking through a camera. So I try and look at the bird first and then photograph it. And then if uh, the bird's behavior allows it and it's a good setting, I try and adjust the angle to get better light or compose my shot versus just kind of a documentary shot of, of the bird. Cool. And folks can still, you're still keeping your blog updated and folks can follow along on your website. And I, I would say, I would say no, the, the birding project has, um, has been in hibernation for a while. So I've updated like the sales end of the website and some of the products that I've seen or enjoyed, and those are still up there, but I'm not because writing my book took a, a lot of time. Uh, and the editing process took a while. Um, after I, I published, I, was not really looking forward to, I had to write my, my thesis for grad school. So I did a lot of writing in a short amount of time. Yeah. And so yeah. kind of spending my, my time as a teacher, I do a lot of reading and, and working on writing with students, but in my free time writing and then publishing on the birding project hasn't been uh, anywhere close to my top list of priorities. So I'm hoping in, in the future, I have a vision for what I'd like to, to get the birding project to. And that doesn't involve just me. It involves a whole team of people that want to contribute. They want a platform to write about birds, to share their stories. And so I'm really looking to build a team of people where the birding project could be self-sustaining. It's no longer like my thing with my content. 
but it's a platform that all birders can share their experiences and, and stories with. And so I'm hoping that that will probably be a summer project um, when I'm not teaching and have time to focus and network and get people who are excited about contributing and, and carrying that on uh, plugged in and giving them the chance to do that. Fantastic. Wow. Well, I look forward to seeing that as it emerges. And uh, thank you so much, Christian. This was just really beautiful and inspiring and, and also had a lot of practical tips, which was pretty cool. So I'm sure everybody uh, was excited about that. And I guess if they want to learn more, they should uh, get your book. And uh, there's probably a whole lot more information in there. Um, I'm certainly going to do that. So uh, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much, Gabriel, uh, for hosting this and for the yeah. Linnaean Society of New York for inviting me. I sure appreciate it. Yes, and Ken's going to say a few words. Wow. Thank you so much, Christian. That was a fantastic, uh, really excellent presentation. Um, you certainly covered a lot of territory, both literally and figuratively. And um, I just want to thank you uh, for all you do as an educator to encourage and challenge others to engage with and study nature. Good for you. Kudos. Uh, I hope that everyone enjoyed tonight's presentation um, and that you will return next month when we will present uh, Michael Overstegen and the importance of photography and conservation. Until then, my very best wishes to you and yours for a wonderful, warm, joyous, birdy holiday season uh, and get out there and keep up the winter birding. Um, Stay healthy, stay active, stay positive, and uh, cheers to everyone and a very good night.